Hello, my name is Ann Zajac, and I'm a veterinary parasitologist at the Virginia Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine at Virginia Tech. Now, most small ruminant producers have to include parasite control in their management plans. And it's become such an enormous problem for many, many owners. One of the great things about NSIP and use of estimating estimated breeding values is that we can help with that. And so using estimated breeding values in parasite control is a component of our workshop. And my job is to lay the groundwork uh, with three mini lectures on the basics of parasites and the importance of parasite control and the kinds of things we use for parasite control and how genes uh, can function in parasite control. So I wanna present some information that I hope will be useful for beginning sheep and goat owners, but also for more experienced small ruminant owners as well. Now, what do we say when we talk about worms uh, in sheep and goats? What do we mean by that? Uh, there are several different types of worms that occur in small ruminants. Some of them like tapeworms and whipworms are generally common, but we don't consider them to be very important because they don't really contribute to ill health in the animals. The, the ones that we are uh, most concerned about and the ones that we really are talking about when we talk about worm control are species that are all in the same family of parasites, and they're often referred to as trichostrongyles. These worms are in general very small. The biggest ones are only about an inch. They're quite thread-like, as you can see uh, in the worms in that petri dish on the left. And different species of the worms in this family are found in the stomach. Some are found in the intestine. And all together, we call them collectively gastrointestinal nematodes. You'll see them referred to in that way if you're doing any reading. If they're present in large enough numbers, really any member of this group could cause problems in sheep or goats, but there's one in particular that really stands out. And those of you who have any experience with small ruminants will know which one I'm talking about. It's the barber pole worm, Amoncus contortus. And the reason that barber pole worm is so important uh, is largely because it's slightly different than the other members of this, this family of worms in that it feeds directly on blood. And adults of the parasite live in the stomach where they feed on blood that's released from vessels in the stomach wall. And large numbers of these worms can cause anemia, bottle jaw, which is just uh, edema that results from anemia. You can see that in the bottom picture uh, of those on the right. And then also animals can develop such severe anemia that they become weak and even die. In the lower numbers, this worm can cause reduced weight gains and poor condition without actually causing death and very low numbers may not produce any signs at all. The reason that this worm gets its name, barber pole worm, is because since it is a blood feeding parasite, you have the red uh, intestinal tract of the worm that's full of blood that wraps around the white reproductive tract and you actually get a candy cane like appearance or barber pole appearance to the worm. And overall, if we look at which parasites are causing problems in small ruminants, it's this barber pole worm that's really responsible for most of the production loss and death caused by gastrointestinal nematodes. The other species in this family can be uh, supporting characters, but they're not the prime actor that barber pole worm is. Now these parasites uh, all follow the same sort of pattern in their life cycle. And since so much of our ability to control the parasites is based on 
uh, management practices, you really need to understand their life cycle in order to effectively control them. The male and female adult worms live in the GI tract and they live there for several months. So an individual male or female gastrointestinal nematode can live for a few months. The males and females mate uh, and females produce eggs that are passed in the manure of the host animal. Those eggs hatch while they're still in the manure. Larvae are, uh, are produced, they grow, they develop, they feed on bacteria that are in the manure, and they go through a couple of molts until they eventually reach the third larval stage, which is the infective stage. And once these larvae are at the infective stage, they'll move out onto the grass, and then sheep and goats are infected while they're grazing. They consume the larvae along with the grass that they're eating. So all grazing sheep and goats have gastrointestinal nematodes. There's really no exceptions. If they're eating grass, they have these worms. But worms aren't necessarily a big problem for every animal. And we're gonna talk about some of the factors that influence how important they are. But one important factor is local weather and local conditions. And the reason for that is that the eggs and the larvae have to develop and survive while they're in the environment being exposed to external conditions, conditions not in the animal, but outside the animal. And so when you look at that life cycle, steps two to four here with eggs passing out in the feces and then having to develop to the infective stage, that occurs out in the environment and the degree of success that occurs with these parasites then developed, uh, the degree of success is based on the conditions that they encounter. And development to the infective stage is really favored by warmth and moisture. And so it usually in most areas proceeds best in the summer grazing season and when it's really warm in the summer, really warm, it takes about a week or a few days less for that egg to develop into an infective larva. As weather gets colder, the rate of development slows down. And so spring and fall, it takes longer for the, the parasite to reach the infective stage. And in cold winter weather, there's really no development or the development is very slow. Barber pole worm in particular really does not like cold weather. Freezing weather will kill most barber pole worms. So we've got development that really is favored by warmth and moisture. But then once the infective larvae forms, it's nice if they can hang around as long as possible in order to maximize their chances of being ingested by a sheep or goat. And so the survival of the infective larvae is actually favored by moisture again. Everybody needs moisture in the environment, but survival is, uh, is really favored more by cooler temperatures. So I think having uh, having listened to what I've said about what kind of conditions they like, it's really not a very difficult choice uh, to judge whether our worms here, our gastrointestinal nematodes, would prefer this type of environment or this environment, which actually is my farm with my grazing sheep. And yes, the environment the worms like the best is going to be this one, where we've got nice lush green grass, plenty of moisture. So where we look at uh, where most parasite problems, uh, most problems with barber pole worm occur in the Eastern US, US, we're really looking at the Eastern and Central US as being the parts of the country where barber pole worm is the most successful. And it turns out that these are the same areas that have seen the biggest growth recently in the number of sheep and goat farms. This particular uh, map shows changes in the total sheep and lamb inventory in the past um, 20 years or so, but uh, 
If you look at the number of goats in the US, you'll see that they're concentrated mostly in the Eastern and Central US. So where we have the most owners, the most producers, we have the biggest problems with barber pole worm. And then when do most problems occur with barber pole worm? Well, they're going to occur where you're getting rapid transmission of the parasite. And that's gonna depend on the weather and depending really on where, how far you go north and south. So in Vermont, they have a worm season where they can have problems with barber pole worm, but that worm season mostly occurs July and August. In Virginia, in my part of the country, we can see worm season really extending from June through October, even into November when we have really mild temperatures. And if you go farther south to Georgia or Florida, you could really have worm season almost all year long. So it's the weather really that's going to determine when the parasites are being most actively transmitted and when most of the problems are gonna show up. So I've talked about what limits gastrointestinal uh, nematodes in the, uh, in the larval stages, in those stages that are out in the environment that they, where they have to deal with uh, local climatic uh, conditions. But when we talk about the worms inside the animal, so after sheep and goats get infected, then what limits gastrointestinal nematodes. And now there are different challenges because when you think about it, if you're a worm inside the animal, it's nice and warm. Uh, you have food available 24 seven. So we don't have to worry about fluctuating temperatures or fluctuating moisture levels. What we have to worry about inside the animal uh, mostly is the animal's immune response. And certainly sheep and goats do develop an immune response to these gastrointestinal nematodes. Now there's a couple characteristics of those, uh, of that immune response that uh, are important to the functioning of it. One is that we have an, an immunity that doesn't eliminate the worms. So once an animal becomes immune, that doesn't mean it no longer has worms. It's still going to have the worms. What the immune response does is it limits the numbers and it limits the success of reproduction of the worms. The immune response also doesn't fully develop until the animals mature. And so that means that while animals are immature, yes, it's developing, but it's not as strong as it will be later. And so young animals are always more vulnerable to these parasites than adult animals are. And we also know that sheep tend to have a stronger immune response than goats. So while we don't really see healthy adult sheep generally uh, with problems with these parasites, right? So healthy adult sheep can usually control the worms on their own. But with adult goats, we're more likely to encounter even adult animals that have problems with worms. So if I can summarize what I've just talked about here, gastrointestinal nematodes, especially Haemonchus contortus, cause poor growth, anemia, and death in large numbers, especially in kids and lambs. All grazing animals have gastrointestinal nematodes. In the life cycle of these parasites, the worm eggs are passed in manure. They develop to the infective stage on pasture, and they're ingested by sheep or goats and then cause infection once they're ingested. Environmental conditions really contribute to the importance of gastrointestinal nematodes because of the need of eggs and larvae to survive out on the pasture. And immunity develops, but it's not fully expressed till maturity. So all these points are important to understanding management practices, and they're also going to come into our understanding of the role of genetics. And in my second little lecture, I'm going to talk about our current practices for managing worms and where we can have success and where we have problems. Now, for further information on any topic related to parasite control uh, on the, the uh, information I've discussed here and on information I'm going to present in the subsequent lectures, the best site to look for 
Uh, more information is the website of the American Consortium for Small Ruminant Parasite Control. There's a tremendous amount of information there, more than I'm sure you, you would want to read. So that is a really excellent site and I would uh, direct you to that. And then finally, I just would like to remind you that funding for our workshops and our other outreach activities related to NSIP and parasite control is supported by the USDA Northeast SARE program, which uh, deals with uh, problems of owners in the Northeast.